Hey, welcome to Our Defining Moments. I'm your host, Mary McClements. In this podcast, I talk with people about the split second moments in their lives that sent them in directions that they never expected. From the woods of Vermont to the streets of San Francisco to the Camino de Santiago in Spain, you may be astonished by the chain reactions these moments have had not only for my guests, but for those around them. Hello, welcome back to yet another episode of Our Defining Moments. Today, my guest is Mad Collage, a what I consider to be a prolific collage artist who is originally from Spain, a place that I adore. So when I met Mad Collage for the first time, I kind of loved her right away. Not only because she was from Spain, but that had something to do with it, but because she had a certain shine and honesty about her, a certain rawness that I really admire. And she probably doesn't know these opinions I have of her, but you might've guessed she's here because she's going to share about a defining moment in her life. So bienvenido, welcome, Mad Collage. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. Thank you so much. No, I didn't know anything about that. And now I'm very overwhelmed and shy all of a sudden. (laughs) <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was like, oh, is this going to put her on the spot if I tell her how taken I was But the first time I met her? But yeah, I really was. I was just like, oh, there's some people out there who you just like you want, you want to be around them or you want to get to know them better, like almost instantly. And that's, yeah, that's how I, I was like, oh my God, this woman is just amazing. So welcome. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to try my hardest to only refer to you as Mad Collage, not okay. with a name that you used when I first met you. Because I really respect when somebody wants to be called something different. You want people who want to be referred differently. So, but I might make a mistake. I might slip up and I can, I'll edit it out, but I'm going to try my hardest. So no problem. No problem at all. It's just a, a, you know, it's a public sphere and then there's a a private sphere. and, And when we met, it was of course privately. And so, yeah, but I mean, it's fine. (laughs) Don't worry. Yeah. And yeah, I might ask you more about that later. Okay. So I already said you were from Spain, which I'm guessing is something that you deeply relate to. What are your, so you're a collage artist and I mean, I love the history of artists and, you know, my background is in fine arts and I think artists have tend to have a really fascinating background, maybe more so than others. I'm not really sure. So you grew up in Madrid, right? I did. I am from Madrid and I shouldn't say Madrid because that's an, I'm saying that with an English accent. I should say Madrid. Madrid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I should say it right. You know, even though I've been for such a long time, but yeah, I grew up there. I spent my first 22 years of my life there. And uh, yeah, I think that's still, even after all this time, that's, that's the place that finds me the most. Yeah. 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 Do you have like any specific memories that you think about often or that pop into your brain every once in a while about Madrid? Like when you think of Madrid in your childhood, like what are the good moments? I have lots. I have good moments, not such good moments, but memory is a very funny thing. You have to be where I be where, I mean, I understand that memory is made of a lot of things and the memory can trick you. It can be a interesting entity, And I remember things from when I was little. Of course, I remember my father most, more than anything else. I remember times and places that I visited with with him. And I have a lot of wonderful memories, of course, of my city. And then I have other memories that are not as pleasant because there were times growing up when things were not as idyllic. Yeah. you know, that has more to do with my family life. It's a mixed bag, but the city, of course, it's beautiful, it's mm-hmm. welcome. It's what I knew when I was growing up, uh, the people, the places, the smell. I can even remember sounds and smells. Um, yeah. I often dream about the city and places mm-hmm. that I used to know. And the interesting thing when I was talking about how memory is uh, very fickle, thing is because I don't really know if those things that I remember are even in existence anymore. Maybe they're just in my memory now. That's a sobering thought. (laughs) That's sobering for sure. And it's okay, right? It's like you get to make up your memories if you want to. And 
I think so often we do that subconsciously, whether it's, um, yeah. No, I think you're right. I think that you have to understand memory as a separate thing from reality, because I think it, it's kind of like finding, do you remember, I'm old enough to remember tapes, you know, like. Yeah, cassette remember? tapes. Yeah. Tapes, that's right. And it's almost like finding one of those lost in a drawer, you know, and you put it up. The quality of the sound is different and uh, you listen to what you were saying and you think, oh my, was, was that me, you know? But oh. it is order, you know, it's a memory. So it's fixed in my mind. There are a lot of things that are fixed in my mind, but I don't know, maybe that's the only place where they exist anymore. I absolutely love that analogy of the cassette tape. That's so good. Like, right, yeah, yeah. And, and something you find in a junk yeah. drawer. Yeah, like that, yeah. You know? I- I wouldn't even be able to play a cassette. I mean, I don't, I don't have a cassette player anymore. Shocking. I don't know. Yeah. Me either. That's sad. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but I really love that, that that analogy. Yeah. And I mean, it could be, this could be multiple episodes of how our memories are different than people who were in the same room at a certain event and how their memories are completely different. Like that, all of that brain stuff just fascinates me. But anyway, so thanks for describing, you know, like good things, bad things like everybody has when you were in Madrid. Can you paint a picture? No pun intended because you are an artist, but (laughs) can you paint a picture of what your life was like in Madrid? Like what kind of home did you live in? Like what types of things did you do when you were a child or a teenager? Well, I was lucky in many respects. Uh, We had what I think would be considered an upper middle class type of uh, upbringing. And I uh, went to private schools. I went to British school since I was in kindergarten. Uh, So I learned English from the time that I was very little. We lived in a very nice part of the city. So no complaints in there at all. And father made a very good living. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. I have one younger sister, barely a year younger. And on the surface, on the surface, all very nice and, you know, very a well-oiled machine, I would say. But of course, the surface of things, what you see is not always the reality of what you're experiencing. Right. Um, and there was quite a bit of conflict in the family. So uh, as far as the city schools uh, were very nice, I had some friends. I, I can't say that I was a very gregarious child. Mm. Uh, more of a, I always felt a little different from people around me, mm. different in my interests, different in my way of expressing things and relating mm. to other people. I had a little bit of difficulty with that. Do I you was, think that's a, sorry to interrupt, but do you think that's like not, a, a creative artistic thing? Because I feel like every single artist that I know, including myself, has felt that yeah, I never, I didn't really quite fit in. I mean, right, I had friends, but yeah. Do you think that's a... It's very possible. In my case, I know that uh, some of it was because of the issues that I was dealing with at home as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what types of things did you do when you were a young child or a teenager? Did you play sports? Did you like, what kind of things did you like to do? I made things. I was... (laughs) Shocking. I was... (laughs) I'm so original. I was a maker from, I just even can't remember a time when I was not making or dismantling sometimes to Uh despair, dismantling something to figure out what was inside. Because I always wanted to know why. I wanted to know why things and how things worked, what was inside of things, how things were put together. You know, I was very inquisitive, not just Mm -hmm. with people, in questions, but also just with objects in general. I was, yeah, I was a dismantler of whatever was around. I and love that. So would you like take apart clocks or like, what would you dismantle? I would dismantle anything. Mm. I, huh. I I destroyed a TV once. Oh when God, TV, I love it. You know, those clunky old boxes, the black and white boxes. and um, That were about 400 pounds. Yeah, very expensive. Well, they were very expensive at the time and not very common. I, they were all black and white, you know, uh-huh. back then. I remember perfectly that enormous, you know, TV that we had. Enormous in the sense of deep. Yeah. It was 
like two feet deep. Yeah, well, t- they used to take up half the room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Own piece of furniture, you know. Yeah. And, so yeah, no, but also making things out of the most disparate objects. I would just, I was like a hunter gatherer in the mm. house. Oh, uh, I love that. Th- things that people would throw out. I always thought, what a waste! Don't throw that out. It has a perfectly obvious use, and I would make things out of anything that was around. So uh-huh. yeah, and then getting trouble a lot because of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> so so this, this is kind of a side note. I don't know how old you are, but I know that you were alive when Franco was in control. Yeah. Do you think that had any influence on you in your art? I mean, that's a really big kind of art question. I'm, I'm not going to get into right now, like what influences you? But I was just in Spain and walking one of the Caminos and some of the towns, it was like being thrown back into the Franco era. You know, the uh-huh. buildings were just so awful and yeah and so do you feel like that kind of seeped into your creativity or wanting to dismantle things well I think that when Franco died I was nine Mm -hmm. if I remember correctly and you like I was saying earlier actually the area that I lived in in Madrid and I'm, I'm not sure what city you're referring to but I mean a lot of the cities in Spain big cities and small cities and towns. Uh, of course, they have the old section of the town and that yeah. can go back to Roman times. Yeah, beautiful. And then you have the very new parts where you have skyscrapers and, and big, you know, buildings and and fairly nondescript, you know, I mean, architectural feats, but you can find them anywhere in the world and they're yeah. pretty much the same. So the part where I lived was built during the 60s. It was very typical for that time. And it was uh, a lot of green areas, a big building. It was beautiful. You know, we had found, we had, I mean, it was all, I never, you know, noticed any kind of, by the time I was alive and this was towards the end of the Franco regime and Mm -hmm. uh, because he was very old and he was losing his grip on things. and. it was just not a defining thing for me as it okay. had been my father's age or my mother's age, for instance. Yeah. There was a big difference in age between my dad and my mom. It had been defining personally for both of them in different mm. ways. Mm. But me, not so much. I do remember, though, and this is an interesting, if you want a defining moment, which is not the one that we're going to be talking about today, uh-huh. but this is another example. Sure. When it was announced on TV that Franco had died... We were having, I think, lunch, if I remember correctly, because it was daytime and we would all, we would all have lunch together. I mean, th- that's something that people still do in Spain, the whole family yeah. together. And we were sitting around the table and we had the TV on, the black and white TV on. And the, the one minister, that you had yet to take apart. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. That's when he was still working. And <laughs> thankfully for, for that defined for moment. That moment. Yeah. And the prime minister came on and he announced that Franco had died. And, you know, there there had been a vacuum there for a few days because they hadn't announced it. We didn't know if apparently, and this is something that I learned afterwards, you know, because I I love history and I read about that Mm. uh, that time as well. It wasn't known if he was actually dead or alive for a little while. You know, that's something that all apparently totalitarian dictators in common, they don't really want people to know when they actually did. He finally came on TV and said, you know, that he had died and we were having lunch. I remember I was having soup and that's a very interesting thing to remember. I was having soup with letters in it, you know, like, Oh my God. Yeah. And uh, my dad, we were just watching TV and they cut the programming and he came on and he said, Franco has died. And he started crying. The the prime minister, on TV and then I looked at my dad and my dad's face was you know it was I don't know if he was shocked if he was fear if he was Mm -hmm. a mix of all of it because nobody knew what was going to happen from that moment on and the fear Mm -hmm. the actual fear for people that had lived through the war like my dad was that there was another civil war coming I love the imagery of that moment and that time, especially the pasta letters in your soup. Oh yeah. my God. Like, 
down and I was having alphabet soup when it was announced that Franco died. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's amazing, right? The things that our brain clings on to smells yes. that soup. Yes. That's why I was talking about memory. It's just very interesting. One more thing I want to ask about before we talk about your defining moment is the chronic pain that you've suffered from for a long time, 18 years, I believe. And in your bio on your website, it says something like chronic pain doesn't like to travel solo, meaning, Mm -hmm. well, tell me what you mean. Well, what I mean is that chronic pain can invite itself into your life in many different ways. I mean, there's many different doors that can open and suddenly it's there. It could be an accident. It could be sudden. It could be progressive. Like in my case, there are many reasons. You know, I have some genetic predisposition because I have some autoimmune diseases that I have from birth. So it was almost an inevitable outcome that at some point or another, I would start, my pain would become chronic instead Uh of sporadic. But there's, you know, for a long time, you manage, you Mm -hmm. manage pain in a way that it allows you to lead a more or less normal life. You don't feel different from other people who are not experiencing pain, or maybe they experience very brief periods, period of pain that are caused by a finger or, you know, twist an ankle or things like that that are painful. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it has a beginning, a middle and an end. And you know what the progression is going to be. And then it passes and you're back to your normal self. It comes a point when that middle part of the pain experience expands. Mm -hmm. And you start realizing that the middle is, it's very long. and. And the pain seems to, it's like it starts taking more space in your life. Before it was just sitting in the corner and it would make itself known every once in a while and you would deal with it. You would, you know, you kind of ignore some, it. Try. Right. Yeah. You can ignore it. You're able to ignore it or just to put it in its place, in its proper place at the time. And it's just, It is a part, but it's it's a minor part of your life. But suddenly it starts growing and starts taking more space and demands more attention. And it's very greedy. The pain is very... And it starts taking and it takes. And all of a sudden you realize that you've taken your eye off the ball and this pain has grown onto something that it's it's no longer just a part. Now it's on the driver's seat. Uh-huh. Which You're I'm just, sure I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Which no, I'm sure no. drives you right to depression or it, you, many other things. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're making this I wouldn't say friends, but you know, you're meeting depression and you're meeting anxiety and pain invites all these friends that it has, you know, to the party. And because uh, it's greedy. It is great. And he wants, you know, it it just doesn't, like I said, it doesn't like to travel solo. It doesn't, it doesn't come by itself to the party. It comes Mm -hmm. with friends, you know, Mm -hmm. and depression and anxiety being in my case, at least, and I can only speak from personal experience, the most prevalent and the most persistent ones. Yeah. And they grow together, you know, so then it becomes this strange loop, whereas, you know, when the depression makes the pain worse, the pain makes you more depressed, then you have the anxiety of fearing the flare-ups, and it just all becomes this loop that it's impossible to break. Mm -hmm. And realize that you don't have any control over it anymore. Yeah, it's really hard for me to relate to that. I mean, because we talked about temporary pain and Mm -hmm. having broken a lot of bones and torn Achilles and having sciatica, like the right beginning, middle and an end. And when you're in the middle with a, you know, temporary pain, I can't even imagine having that all of the time. Like I can't relate to it. I don't know if I'd be able to live or survive or I don't, I don't know. Many times, particularly as time goes by. And what happens is that when I was saying that the pain takes up space, yeah, 
I don't have unlimited space in my life in the sense that I don't have unlimited energy or time. Yeah. So what happens is that the pain pushes out other things to live in that space. Yeah, yeah. And like joy. Like, like a lot of things, you know, yeah. a lot of being with your friends and mm-hmm. sports and doing things that you enjoy, like in my case, dancing or hiking or gardening, so many things, you know. Yeah. And then it changes you in a very fundamental way because, I mean, it does change your brain, which is something that I've learned through treatment and with time. Yeah. I've had ample time to learn these things, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and it does change your brain. So you start catastrophizing a lot and it just mm. eats itself. It's a monster. It's a real yeah. big and like I said, it's greedy and yeah. it's relenting. And yeah, you ask yourself sometimes, you, you start asking yourself, can I do this? Mm-hmm. Uh, can I mm-hmm. Do I want this the way it is? Because your life becomes very small and it becomes all about the pain. And who wants a life that it's all about the pain? I mean, it's like, I mean, I don't know if Chinese torture is is the right expression, but you know, the old expression of the the little drip, 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 you know? yeah. Yeah. And it becomes so overwhelming and you've taken the hands of the wheel completely. I mean, they, it doesn't let you get yeah. you on the wheel. So you're just like on a roller coaster that never comes to a halt. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I want to get off this ride, you know, yeah. to get off this ride. It's not worth it for me anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So that, I'm, glad, I'm glad you're still here and I'm sorry <laughs> that if you've, that you've gotten to that place before, it sounds like where I'm just like, what, where you feel, you know, is this worth it? What is, yeah, what is this? I'm no. Always fighting. It was no. At, the, at many times, mm-hmm. the answer in my brain was, no, this is not worth it. What do I do now? That's one of the things that is part of my defining, defining moment. Yeah. Is realizing that there's no way, I know this for a fact, that I'm the only person out there who's suffering from any kind of chronic pain and who's having this kind of experiences and these kinds yeah. of these kinds of thoughts, you know, yeah. I know I'm a person and, and why not talk about it? Why not say, yes, I, you know, yeah. I have these thoughts and I think it's fairly normal actually. We're going to take a short break now to hear from our sponsor, Take Passage Coaching. This is still Mary, and I happen to be the owner and lead coach of Take Passage Coaching, and I'm thrilled I asked myself to be my own sponsor. Seriously, though, Take Passage Coaching is a trauma-informed, transformational coaching practice that supports people who are ready to move from uncertainty and doubt to the ability to clarify what they expect for themselves. At Take Passage Coaching, I work with clients to help them look at their negative thoughts, not as the messy parts of themselves to stuff away, but how to use those thoughts as fuel. I know you've probably heard all the promises before, and you may have been working on your stuff for ages with not much progress. But one reason why Take Passage Coaching is different is that I celebrate all of your messy parts, the parts you're embarrassed about, the things you may consider weaknesses, and I help you to see them, that they are all gifts and they are all strengths. So whether you're someone who has experienced trauma, and if you're human, you have, or are ready to do the scary things in life that you've been telling yourself you can't, Take Passage Coaching is ready to help you with the transition and change that you want. So go ahead and reach out to takepassagecoaching.com to book a free exploratory session and take good care. Why don't you go ahead and tell us about your defining moment? Okay. I was thinking when you first contacted me and you told me a little bit about what the podcast was going to be about, I thought, well, what do I pick? Because I think that defining moments happen to everyone all the time. Every day. Yeah. Yeah. I think that sometimes they're not self-evident. They're very stealth, but we don't know that they've happened until some time has passed. Right. Right. And we realize, oh, what that was a defining moment. And I, yeah, like, oh, that memory. Yeah, it, I think it goes back to memories also. Yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. It all goes back to memory. But 
my personal defining moment, the one that I've picked from, from many, because there have been many, yeah. is very recent. And I wanted to talk about this one in particular because it's a hopeful moment. Mm. And particularly because the backdrop to it is all the pain and all the things that we've been talking about up until now, the dark, darkest, really dark moments and, you know, and all the treatments and all the failures and all the things that went wrong and the pain not abating and, and, and the fear and all those things, that's the backdrop. That's as if I was on a stage that would be all behind me. And my defining moment happened despite being surrounded by all that. Mm-hmm. So I'm pretty proud of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And right, it sounds like, what's that expression? A watershed, uh, watershed moment, defining moment. Yeah, so. Yeah, and, and it was the launching of my mad collage practice and the mad collage as a business endeavor, as a something else other than a personal practice that was happening in the private sphere in, in my studio, in my home, yeah. and just for my own benefit, which is, it is very, I mean, it still is very beneficial, but it, I transform it into something else. I transform it into a business which has a completely different slant and, a, you know, you have to acquire a whole different kind of set of skills to run that I didn't have. And I was able to do that despite dealing with the pain, despite dealing with the fear, despite dealing with all these things that we've been talking about. Mm-hmm. Anything, if it, I mean, it doesn't say anything. I'm not saying that it, there's anything heroic about it. I don't know what it says about me, but more than anything is so that other people that might be in a similar situation as mine realize that you still have the capacity mm. to do things that you don't think you will be able to do. So that's why I picked this as my defining moment, because perhaps it could, it could become a template for somebody else's defining moment. I don't know. Well, I know. I think, it's, <laughs> I think that's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. And I don't consider myself a crier, but I'm totally tearing up. Um, the <laughs> fact that you were able to take this darkness and the and literally the pain both emotionally and physically and and create something beautiful not only for yourself but for other people like that's pretty ideal in like when it comes to taking strife and whether it's trauma and then creating something that's going to benefit others i mean that's freaking amazing and you're sticking with it too even though you still have chronic pain Yes, I still do. I'm undergoing treatment right now, yet yeah. another one, but hopefully one that will yield some some positive results. But yeah, I mean, what I don't want to, you know, I want people to understand that it's not a smooth ride, even now. It has its ups and downs, and but what you're saying is true. The key of it all is sticking with it and being yeah. persistent. And if I'm anything, it's persistent. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, it's true, right. I can see that, though I don't know you very well. I can absolutely see it. And I think you have a certain drive, too, which I don't, yeah. you know. Yes, maybe. I do, but it, it's a drive. I don't know, it's manifested in many different ways in my life because, you know, I say, sometimes I've said in the past that I'm a runner. I'm not a runner in the physical sense of running. I can <laughs> run, get to the corner. <laughs> and I would probably collapse if I try. <laughs> but I used to be very athletic when I was younger, actually. And I played a lot of sports in high school and, you know, swimming and all, all kinds of things. But but I'm a runner in my head. Yeah. I, run, mm-hmm. I run. I'm constantly running. I'm running towards things and I'm running away from things. Both. Ooh, what are you running away from? Um, mostly myself. <laughs> Mostly myself, because what I was explaining, uh, trying to explain, I don't know, very successfully or not earlier is that your brain does change. The pain has the ability to change the wiring in your brain Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. how your brain functions and what you focus on. And after 18 plus years of chronic pain, you tend to focus almost exclusively 
on negative things. You know, your brain seem I mean, has a negative bias, apparently, that it's, yes. em- it's embedded in the brain, you know, in normal brain function. But it gets really exacerbated when you are under prolonged stress. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I run away from that. I have mm-hmm. to actively and very diligently work against that. Yeah. Yeah. I end up in a very bad place again. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, and right. We all run away from certain aspects of ourselves by doing yeah. whatever it may be drinking. I don't know. I just like all the, the negative connotations about addiction. Running yeah. could be one, you know, though I find running positive. I want to go back to. The moment where, and I don't know where you were, were you in your studio, your home, were you driving a car when you, when you thought, okay, wait, I do this art. I love doing art and I'm going to create mad collage and I'm going to sell it. I'm going to have classes and I'm going to get the word out about chronic pain. Like, was there a split second of time that you recall? I think it was, it was almost like watching a slow moving. I know it's like, you know, now we can on TV. We're talking about black and white TVs before, <laughs> you know, we had two channels. Thank you very much. Now you can stop things and putting on slow motion. You can do all these things, you know, and, and it would be like watching a scene developing in slow motion because it actually took years. It's a mm-hmm. defining that, that develops slowly over a period of years starting with uh, just a tiny, tiny seed, you know, and then it took a lot of watering and it took a lot of forward movement and then taking steps back away from it, depending on the degree of pain I was experiencing. But you were talking about drive. I'm always pushing myself. I always push myself constantly. And I think that the deeper the pain, Mm. both psychologically and the stronger the pain physically, when I come up for air after one of those bad episodes, yeah. push myself even harder. So I think you can take any number of times, you know, when that happened, where I was determined that this was going to be a reality. Yeah. So it took several pushes. It took several it's, you know, it's not unlike having a baby because you don't say, oh, I'm having a baby and then the baby's there. No, yeah. you know, you have to go through the whole process of the birthing of the baby. It yeah. is. a, And this defining moment for me was a process as mm-hmm. well. And there was a learning curve that we can talk about. And there were moments of frustration and all that is part of making it happen. But I remember the website went live, actually, which was. That was a click of a of a button, actually, yeah. pretty much. And that was the first week of October of 2019. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. We're almost up to the anniversary of it. <laughs> so I actually uh, have some of your print collages right next to me here. And they're both from 2019. Yeah. So yeah. that was when the website went live, very tentatively, for the very first time. And, and of course, it was um, right on time for COVID to hit and yeah. set us back again. But yeah, that was, I would say that that was the, the, nice. the yeah. being, you know, a before and after. Yeah, I love that. The harder your body pushed to try to stop you from doing this, the more you were like, F you. I'm going to work yeah. twice as hard to make this happen. So I kind of, there's like this juxtaposition of your body working against you and you being like, hell no, no. Yeah, no. Uh, and, and that's happened throughout my life because there was a time in my life, and this is for context, you know, you don't acquire, you have a personality and you have certain personality traits that I think are, you're born with, but then you develop one, some of them more depending on your circumstances, or perhaps you acquire new ones depending on your circumstances. And, you know, I wasn't always this determining and this, I don't think I was at least, but maybe the little, again, the little seed was there, but for a long, long time when I was younger and I was already here in the United States and this even before my pain became unmanageable, I had times when everything was conspiring for me to to walk away from art making. Yeah. And 
And for a number of years, I actually, I actually did. It was not on the table. It was not on the cards for me to, to be doing this even after so many years of college. It, I felt yeah. really that I had invested all this time and money and effort going through college and getting a master's degree and everything. And then I, I wasn't able to put any of it to good use. Mm-hmm. And just, well, if I can push back a little bit. Sure. Maybe not the, perhaps it sounds like not the act of creating art, but you took other things, I'm guessing, from that time in your life and education and brought it forward. Sure. No, yeah. there's, <laughs> there's always, I mean, there's always value in the education that you get and it makes you grow as a person and, you know, the experience itself, of course, it makes you grow up as a, as a person. And I, I was always, I never had any idea of uh, doing anything else. There was always a very clear path for me from the time I was very young that I wanted to study art. And I remember my parents not being particularly ecstatic about that. Uh, They both. (laughs) And I just couldn't for the life of me figure out what else I could be doing. I couldn't see Mm -hmm. it in my mind. Mm -hmm. Else. And uh, my initial, my intended destination from the beginning was actually museum studies. I wanted uh-huh. to study restoration. Aha, uh-huh. that, yeah, that kind of fits with your taking things apart and putting them back together. Exactly. And, yeah. I, and I've tried to improve this because it doesn't always help. I was very much a perfectionist mm-hmm. and, and a total art history nerd for um, always. I love been. it. I love it. But I like the idea of working alone and and being with a piece that's being restored, you know, having that Mm -hmm. reverence for the work, Mm -hmm. for the work you're working on and and the museum environment, because museums have always given me, they're my safe place museums. Yeah, yeah. Specific museum. Just going into a museum for me is like going into a church. I'm not Mm -hmm. a religious. My family was not religious, but going into a museum... I just, it's just, I can't imagine. It's like I can breathe better. It's like my brain relaxes. Yeah, it's like a library. It's quiet. You know, people aren't bustling about. I think the last question I want to ask you is, I guess for those who, for those who have chronic pain, you know, what, what sage advice or what could you say to somebody or I don't know, what cheerleading could you give to somebody who has chronic pain who is feeling like, yeah, they can't go on and they certainly can't do the things that they love. Well, I would say, first of all, I know what you've been going through because pain is pain and it doesn't matter what kind of pain you have. And even if it's psychological pain, I can understand that you can get to a very low point, a very extremely low point and not see beyond what's right in front of you. Because that's happened to me. It's like the box gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Or that space that we were saying earlier that pain takes over, you know, you're pushed into a corner and you're less able to move and less able to do things. And it feels very limiting and very small. So I understand. And I think that one of the things I would say is The mental health takeaway, you know, that would be the pain management aspect of art making, for instance, which is something that I merge. I've always merged in mad collage. It's been the not acceptance because I'm not good with acceptance. I have to say that's part of me that that's a part of me that pushes all the time. Yeah. You're not going to tell me what to do. I'm not going to tell anybody to accept that things are going to be the way they are at this moment forever. Mm -hmm. It will not because change is happening. Change is inevitable and it will happen, right? What we need is positive change, of course, not just change for the sake of change. We need change that is advancement and improvement, right? Especially when we're talking about pain. That's the kind of change that we're looking for. So I would say avoid isolation, you Mm. know, with, uh, with COVID, with economic problems and stress and anxiety and all that, that COVID has magnified is difficult, you know, but creativity, and it's something that you can access very privately 
from the comfort of your own home, if and even if you're not in comfort because you have pain, you can still access your innate creativity because believe me, trust me, is there. Yeah. I say try that mm. and repeatedly. Do not throw in the towel because your first try, your second or your third, you know, doesn't come to fruition. It might take many tries. It, it might take a long time. I'm not going to, I'm not in the habit of sugarcoating anything. Yeah. For- That's what I, one thing I love about you and I saw right away. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> it just doesn't work because then it creates expectations that can't be met mm-hmm. and makes things worse for somebody who's dealing with daily chronic pain, you know, mm-hmm. sugar, not the answer for anybody who has chronic pain. Yeah. yeah. So I would say things like be who you are when you are in pain and when you're suffering, tell the world that you're suffering. When you have a better day and you're experiencing something that's nice and your body feels better, tell the world, uh, the world that you're feeling better or do something, you know, that shows that you're feeling better because you're going to have those moments. You're going to have those ups and you're going to have those downs. Thank you for, I mean, really good, solid advice that <laughs> it's um, right. I feel like everybody's going to take it differently. And, and maybe some people will say, well, I can't do any of that and throw in the towel, but yeah, I want to thank you from the deepest depths of my, of my heart for being here today. And I want to end with some visual takeaways. So they are hunter gatherer. I love that. Yeah. Giant black and white TVs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Alphabet soup. Human connection can come from pain and from joy. And avoid isolation and be honest. Really, really amazing. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And yeah, I can't wait to see your new your new work. I'm always peeking at your at your website and reading your emails. I can't wait to see my new work too, because, (laughs) (laughs) right. Uh, Because, you know, it surprises me as well sometimes. So yeah, yeah, that's good. Keep the wonder alive. Thank you, my friend. And I will see you soon. This has been Our Defining Moments with Mary McClements. I'm back next week with more stories of moments in time that change someone's life forever. Please rate and review the show and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a defining moment and want to share, head over to the Our Defining Moment website at ourdefiningmoments.com and click on share a moment. I'm always interested in people's stories and I may feature you on the podcast.